I want to start off um, with a little reality of what's happening. So when we have a conference like this, there's a lot of love. People really adore you guys. They think you're terrific. They love what you say. And we... And we attract a lot of your fans, followers, believers, people that really want to hear what you have to say. But when we post you, your videos on YouTube, we have the whole world and people who have nothing but time to criticize, find fault, and make all kinds of rude and inappropriate comments. So we're getting fantastic views on your videos, hundreds of thousands. Um, you know, two of uh, Dr. Furman's videos are over a half a million. Um, the one pan that you did with Dr. Campbell, Dr. Esselstyn, and Kim Williams is over 600,000. So fantastic views, and that's great. But there's a, a lot of people outside of the plant-based community that are very committed to the paleo, the keto diets. And whether or not we want to ignore them or not, they are there and they're having an influence on what people think. So I want to read everyone something because one of the criticisms of this conference is that it's not a debate. It's not fair. We don't have the paleo people here. We don't have the keto, the low carb people. So people say to me, you know, it's one sided. So I want to read you what these people are saying. It's a little bit longer than normal, but I want to make sure everyone understands what is being said by people who are doctors or are credentialed just because this is what a lot of people are being influenced by. So here we go. So this is first um, Chris Kresser. He says, over the past two decades, red meat has been blamed for everything from heart disease to cancer. Newspaper and magazine publishers love to plaster alarmist headlines about red meat across their front pages, but as you might suspect, these claims are ill-founded and misleading. In fact, an impartial review of the evidence reveals the truth about red meat. It's one of the healthiest foods you can eat. Despite what you've heard, red meat is an extremely healthy and nutrient-dense addition to your plate. It's a great source of vitamin B12, vitamin D, iron, zinc, magnesium, copper, cobalt, and more. He also says... Um, nose to tail eating means including other cuts of meat on your plate, like organ meats, fatty cuts, and bones. The paleo goes on and on, and then he says, meat is an important part of the paleo style eating, yet the most common mistake made by those who go paleo is eating too much meat, muscle meat, that is. By always choosing the muscle meat, like steak or chicken breast, paleo followers tend to ignore the other bits of the animal, skin, cartilage, bone, bone marrow, organ meats, tendons, fattier meat cuts, animal fats, like lard and tallow. If you're not eating nose to tail, you could be missing out on important nutrients. Finally, by Chris Kresser. Chris Kresser also said there were a total of 20 randomized controlled trials, and the results showed that low carb, low glycemic index, Mediterranean high protein diets are effective in improving various markers of cardiovascular risk in people with diabetes and should be, and should be considered the overall strategies of diabetes, diabetes management. He also said that a systemic, systematic review and meta-analysis of dietary carbohydrate restriction in patients with type 2 diabetes found not only was a low-carb diet more effective for diabetes than the low-fat diet, but the greater the carbohydrate restriction, the greater the effect of these reviews of several randomized control trials are finding, and that there's no increase in cardiovascular risk markers. There's actually an improvement in cardiovascular risk markers, and there's an improvement in diabetes markers like blood sugar, insulin, weight, visceral fat, etc. Dr. Ack says, Dr. Josh Ack says, personally, my favorite diet is following more of a traditional diet or a GAPS diet, G-A-P-S. A traditional diet, which is really what our ancestors ate, wasn't just paleo. You know, this diet is more than 6,000 years old, where you're also consuming grass-fed dairy like benefit-rich kefir, plus you're getting in a lot of vegetables and wild meats. It's kind of everything. That's what, that, this is what's promoted by organizations like Western A. Price Foundation. That's the diet I personally follow and love, and when it comes to healing, the GAPS diet is another great diet for you to look into. Stay with me. 
Dr. Jack, Josh, Josh Axe also says, paleo diets are better than vegans for these reasons. One, the paleo diet is modeled after what our ancient, specifically paleolithic ancestors would have eaten thousands upon thousands of years ago. Two, the big positive with the paleo is that you're consuming a lot of wild caught meats that are some of the best omega-3 foods as well as protein foods. Three, so again, the paleo diet's major benefit in terms of following that hunter-gatherer lifestyle, you're getting more minerals, more omega-3 fats, more protein, more healthy fats overall in your diet. In fact, if you follow the paleo diet in the right way, it's been shown to help the Im improve immune illness and support weight loss. More, Dr. D Josh Axe says regarding vegan diets, the issue in doing a vegan diet long-term now, I'm not talking about a few weeks or two weeks or a month, but if you stay on that the majority of your life, you cannot get enough benefit-rich vitamin B12, and then it's very difficult to get the proper amount of amino acids and zinc and certain other nutrients, such as vitamin D in your diet, from consuming a vegan diet. While most vegans realize this, they still tend to be very deficient in B vitamins and the right type of amino acids. Yes, you can address those deficiencies by taking a good quality B12 supplement or a B complex supplement, as well as supplementing with protein powders nonetheless. Nonetheless, following a strict vegan diet is going to leave you with deficiencies. Hold on. Catherine Shanahan, medical doctor, author of Deep Nutrition, why your genes need traditional food, says, eat the whole animal, including the organs. Sure, animal flesh is full of nutrients, but don't overlook the organs. They're rich in vitamins and minerals, says Shanahan, and each one bioconcentrates a different blend. For instance, the liver supplies iron and B vitamins, the kidneys, vitamin A and folate, the, and the brain, vitamin B12, phosphorus and selenium. For many of the same nutrients reach for omega-3 eggs, especially the yolks, counsel Shanahan, bone up. Thanks to collagen, calcium, and glucosamine, bones and cartilage promote bone, joint, and skin health. Collagen even helps reduce cellulite, says Shanahan, who serves as director of the Los Angeles Lakers Pro Nutrition Program. She swears that bone broth is one of the NBA secrets. We're getting a lot of players to have soups that are made with bone stock, and it's really great for their joints. It's like this magic formula. It actually has growth factor-like effect on the collagen, which is the backbone of your skin and joint, she says. Choose dairy produced from grass-fed animals. Okay, so that's the basic reality of what's going on. And there's more people, and they're saying this relentlessly and nonstop, and they're quoting this and that, and the average person out there is influenced by this. So what do you think? Do you want us to go in order? Or? Whatever you like. Well, I guess the first thing that I would say is none of that sounded referenced to me. Um, no references. But I testified about this in front of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee this past summer. Dr. Mills was there with me. Um, there was quite a contingent of low-carb promoters, and some of them were doctors. Um, and some of them, they all seem pretty angry. I'll tell you, the plant-based eating does not, or the uh, paleo diet doesn't do much for their personalities. They had to be told to sit down three or four times, <laughs> talk past their time. So uh, they're not a very well-mannered bunch. But um, I was uh, toward the end, and, and here's what I said. Um, one of the things we have to be very careful of in medicine and in nutritional medicine is that we don't only look at short-term results. Because sometimes things that work great in the short term don't work very well in the long term, all right? So if the only thing you're gonna worry about is what your blood markers look like at the end of 30 days, I actually made this suggestion to the committee. I said there's some things we should consider that work really well for weight loss and cholesterol in 30 days. One of them is cocaine addiction. And this is the thing, have you ever seen a really fat cocaine addict and they have really low cholesterol levels? And people were laughing. I'll tell you something else that works really well is chemotherapy. People lose weight, their numbers come down. Well, obviously these are, I'm being facetious deliberately because if we really don't care about the long term, then let's just throw anything on the table that makes your numbers better in the short term and where does that leave us? Temporarily a little bit better and in the long term a whole lot worse. So the, all the studies that you're citing, I'm familiar with them. And they, they look at what happens to people when they eat a low carb diet for 30 days and yeah, their glucose levels drop. But what happens to those people five years later? Most of them aren't eating that diet because they can't tolerate it. They're, they're, and so they go on to something else that's equally deadly. So that would be my first comment about it.
I could just continue along the same line of what the point you just made, that we do give more credence to studies that follow large numbers of people, hundreds of thousands of people, and they track them for decades, 20 or 30 more years. And the question is, are there studies out there that track large numbers of people, whole populations, and follow them for decades and look at hard endpoints? Because the soft endpoints are things like you lost weight, your cholesterol went down, your triglyceride improved. But we give more credence to look at hard endpoints. Did the person die? What age did they die at? Did they have a heart attack or did they get cancer? And here's what, what the studies do show. And I think that I could accurately say that all the studies, and I said all, I think I can say that with accuracy, all the studies that look at hard endpoints show that as animal products go up in the diet, in a dose-dependent relationship, as they go to higher levels, so do the hard endpoints like heart attacks, strokes, cancers, and deaths. So there's really no controversy here. It's people just talking and we, we want to look at what extends lifespan and gives people the most opportunity to live a long, happy, and healthy life. And we have tremendous information from science in, in modern times. And we can do better than the caveman could did millions of years ago. And by the way, we are biologically very similar to the other primates. And at what point in human history do you decide, oh, that's the diet that's right for us? What about those hundreds of thousands of years? Of, you know, in other words, we're, di we're, we're designed like primates. We're meant to eat a primate-style diet. And we live longest with all the protective factors when we eat our diet of primarily of plants. That doesn't mean a vegan diet in the modern world optimizes every micronutrient. But that's why we have the opportunity today to measure blood and to account for individual differences and to make modifications to make sure people do it properly and correctly and are not deficient in anything they need. So we do have a unique opportunity in human history right now. We can get the best of both worlds. And the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study too study did compare people eating just one or two servings of meat a week compared to those eating none. And they found that even people eating a little bit of animal products did have a higher risk of cardiovascular death. So the facts are we, can give, we have better advice we can offer people with a whole lot of information to make our judgments, to base our judgments on. And that, it gives, and that when we're very happy and enthusiastic about that information we have available to us today. Yeah, there's a massive experiment that's been going on all around you. Just look at how everybody's eating. You know, most people are eating animal-rich diets, and you can see the consequences of that behavior. And you can see the changes in that when you change people to whole plant food diet. We have the, you know, uh, luxury of actually living with our patients at the True North Health Center, and so you see day by day what happens as soon as you change the diet. It's profound, it's predictable, and so I don't, I don't, you know, even beyond all the excellent research that Dr. Furman's, you know, alluding to, you can just open your eyes and look around and tell the truth about, you know, what's real as far as animal food intake is concerned. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, so let me see what I can uh, say uh, and still be allowed to stay on the sa stage. Um, first of all, I, I'm personally am losing my patience with idiots. And <laughs> and just because somebody says something does not mean it's true. Otherwise, we'd be forced to take Rudy Giuliani seriously. Um, and I don't think, I mean, as my esteemed colleagues have all pointed out, the science is clear and it's settled on what diet is best for human beings. So I don't think we need to waste our time sitting up here debating foolishness like the so-called paleo diet or keto because we know that those diets are unhealthy we know they cause more disease. That's like me sitting up debating someone who wants to talk about bringing back slavery. I don't need to do that. That's been settled, okay? So I don't need to talk about feeding people bone cartilage and grease and lard and fat. That's going to kill them. Um, so 
No, this conference is to talk about and educate people on the benefits uh, of, of being plant-based, not to waste our time debating things that have been long settled. So that's why we don't waste our time with that nonsense. And the other thing is, if you watch TV, you know that about every other week they come up with a new disease and they give it an acronym and they pretend that just because they gave it an acronym, it's actually a thing. Paleo is not a thing, okay? It, they, it has a name, but it's not real. Um, if you attended my, my talk today, I alluded to the fact that human beings using Stone Age technology cannot be efficient enough to kill enough animals to subsist on an animal food-based diet. We're just not that efficient. Even the most efficient hunters and predators, tigers, lions, they only make a kill about once every seven to 10 days. So how the heck is some weak little uh, uh, barefoot human being with a, 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 a sharpened spear gonna do any better than that? I mean, it's ludicrous. So the idea that people were running around eating all this meat is made up nonsense. And so when people come to me with that stuff, I tell them, you know what? You have my permission to eat meat every single day for every single meal, because the sooner you kick off this earth, the better off the rest of us. <laughs> I get a little emotional. I <laughs> That's awfully hard to follow. But you know, one of the one thing I want to point out, and I think this goes to when you start looking into things on your own, because you should. You hear conflicting things, you should look into this. And I agree that the debate should be over. I mean, and one thing I'll point out is I think it's pretty silly to talk about what people ate 6,000 years ago or 20,000 or 100,000 years ago. We don't really know, but we have really good data on what people are eating today and the consequences of it. So we don't have to play a lot of guessing games about it. But um, when somebody says, there are articles in medical journals that support this, and that's what a lot of these people are saying. There are over 30 articles showing that a keto diet helps diabetics, or low-carb this and all. Okay, so the first thing is, a great deal of what's published in medical journals is garbage, and it's unfortunately been this way for a very long time. Um, it's gotten worse in the last few decades, but if you go back to when smoking was popular, there were journal articles, articles published in medical journals, showing that smoking had benefits. It, and if I, if I put together a 45-minute slide set and I cited articles from the you know, really prestigious medical journals about smoking, it's not only not harmful, it might help you. You might start to say, gosh, I think I misunderstood the smoking issue a whole lot. Well, the, here's the problem. In order to put that presentation together, I would have to cherry pick some studies that show that this is the case while ignoring the preponderance of the evidence showing that this is not the case. And that's often what these people are doing is cherry picking studies that prove their point because you can find a study that says almost anything. I mean, if you want permission to eat chocolate while directing traffic to lose weight, you'll probably find something in the medical journals that say that that's a good idea. So that really doesn't carry any weight with me when somebody says, oh, there are 25 articles that say this and 35 articles that say that. That's always what they do, but they're cherry picking articles that say these things because as Dr. Furman and said, and Dr. Mills said, the vast majority of the evidence says the other direction, the plant-based direction is the way to go. Um, I also want to say that a lot of times people try to throw up dust and confuse people by saying, well, you know, how do we know what, 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 what people did, uh, you know, uh, 10, 20,000 years ago? We know by looking at what happens to people when they eat these foods now. We have been bequeathed with a certain physiology and, and a suite of genes based on what our ancestors ate. And it turns out that the human body actually responds to selection pressures fairly quickly. How do I know that? I know that by looking at the practice of using cow's milk for energy. The practice of dairying uh, has only been in existence for about roughly five to 6,000 years. Yet over that time, that small amount of time, it was enough to select for 30% of the European population to be lactase persisters. 
And that's because it was important for them to be able to consume dairy products, to make it through the winter, and so it selected out for those people. So if human beings had been really living off of nothing but meat, it would have selected for genes that uh, process cholesterol and fat in ways that didn't end up producing illness, and it hasn't. It would have selected for a digestive tract that didn't get clogged up like a drain full of, uh, of, of, of grease and hair when you eat nothing but meat, uh, instead of one that, that absolutely needs fiber in order to function properly. We have a, a digestive tract and a physiology that, as uh, Dr. Furman pointed out, is like that of the other primates. It is a plant-based uh, um, uh, uh, physiology. And that is how we know what our ancestors ate. They weren't eating meat. They weren't eating bison. They were eating plants. And again, that's why when you get ready to spray, spray perfume or cologne on, you're not spraying old of, of, of the slaughterhouse, you're spraying something that smells like flowers and fruit. <laughs> okay. When this conference is over, um, a lot of people will be motivated to learn more about health and nutrition. And there are a lot of sources. You can go to a nutritionist, a registered dietitian, a medical doctor, you can look at university studies, medical journals, clinical trials, government agencies like the USDA and FDA, what politicians say, what media says, what the scientific studies say, um, what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, formerly the American Dietetic Association says. Um, you can listen to the companies themselves. Which one of these people should we listen to? I know which, which, which when these people speak, should we say, okay, great, that's what my, you know, my nutritionist said something, my dietitian, who do we, who of these sources of information should we listen to or not listen to based on everything that you're aware of? None of them. <laughs> so here's the thing. This is something I've been talking about for a long time, this informed decision-making concept where you look at anybody who's telling you anything about anything in medicine, a procedure you should have or a diet that you should eat or whatever. And what you really want to do is look at the evidence for um, the benefits that you're going to get, the risks that you're going to take and determine if it's worth it. And, and when you think about it, this is the way you buy everything. I mean, I've never met anybody who says, yeah, you know, I, uh, you got a new car? Yeah, it's the one the salesman told me I had to drive. I really don't like it that much, but you know, I have to, I have to drive it. People don't let other people tell them what to do. They don't live in houses that other people tell them to buy, and they don't drive cars other people tell them to buy. So I think you look at health people, health uh, professionals as advisors, and you check into what they're saying. And sometimes when you do this, you find out that the person that you're thinking of listening to doesn't know what they're talking about. So you get rid of that person, you go on to the next person. Everybody at this table, I think, qualifies to give advice based on the fact that we back up what we say with science that's reliable. But if you're looking in your own community, don't look for a guru. Take responsibility yourself for checking things out before you, you do it. And it's interesting, I ask people, why are you taking this supplement? My cousin sells it. Why are you eating this diet? My neighbor did keto and told me about it when we were mowing the lawn one day, and I decided to do it too. These are not good decisions, not good reasons to do things. But it's also not good to eat a keto diet because a dietitian told you to do it or to eat a paleo diet because a medical doctor told you to do it. So forget about the source of the information and verify the information itself because the, looking for gurus is why a lot of people are in trouble right now. They believed what people told them. I, I agree 100%. I also, I always tell people, when I tell you something, assume I'm Sarah Sanders and I'm just making it up as I go along <laughs> and, and Google it, research it for yourself. But I think the, the ultimate, ultimate test is, number one, make sure whoever you talk to is plant-based and knows what they're talking about. But you ultimately are going to have to experience it for yourself. And the reason I call Gary up here is, yeah, I know, man, I'm, 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 I'm just dragging you out. Um, we had just a spontaneous conversation today about the fact that Gary's one of the uh, AB guys that because he was stuck here do working like 
you know, um, well, a field hand is probably not a good <laughs> example. He basically didn't have time to go out and get what he usually ate, so he started eating the vegan food. And Gary, just kind of share with them what you share with me, man, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I, was, what I was sharing with him was, and what I shared with a lot of people at the conference is when I first took on this assignment, I thought, you know, vegan, I was like, these people are crazy. Like, there's no way I'm gonna <laughs> sit and eat plants. And because uh, we, like as, as he said, we don't have time to go out and get food. We are basically eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner here. Uh, I, I just began to eat the food. And I didn't, didn't give it any thoughts. I have high blood pressure. Um, I have, uh, I'm pre-diabetic. I'm taking medication for all of that. And after several days of eating the food, I began to feel better. I, I, I did. Um, <laughs> I started having more energy. I mean, we, the first day we were here, we did 36 hours straight. And normally, if I was eating my regular you know, diet of chicken or whatever you know, I normally eat, I, I would have been exhausted. Um, but I feel a lot better. I feel a lot more energetic. And um, I can attest that I think this is there's something to this. You know, I, I don't know anything, I don't know anything about the vegan diet. I know nothing about it. Except for the fact that we were here, we were stuck here, and we're eating the food. And I feel I, f I feel a lot better. I do. I honestly do. So thanks for letting me talk to you. That's that's the ultimate test. Your body will tell you. That that was and what I shared with him was. When I went plant-based as a teenager, three days into it, I woke up and I'm like, what the hell? I've got more energy, I need less sleep, I feel different and I feel better. And that is what's going to sh convince you and, and show you that this is the way to, that we should all be eating. The proof is in the, the, uh, the, the plantains. <laughs>— Assume someone is eating a whole food, plant-based diet. What is the exact current advice on supple nutritional supplementation? Should we be taking B12, essential fatty acids, vitamin D, DHA, EPA? What is the very specific list of supplements that all whole — you could say for anyone in the country, but specifically if you're following a whole food, plant-based diet? and you'd want to stay healthy and avoid disease forever, what is the supplements that you are recommending or not recommending? Okay, well, I, I did speak about this a little bit today already, and I made two um, important points. And one was that there are certain supplemental recommendations that we think are harmful and increase the risk of cancer and shortens people's lifespan. And those are particularly um, folic acid, which is not present in nature. What we get from fruits and vegetables is folate, which is not the same compound as folic acid. And, there, and the long-term studies that look at people using folic acid supplementation long-term show an increased risk of common cancers. I'm very concerned about the um, excessive use of folic acid in our modern community being a risk factor of cancer. Isolated beta carotene has some risks, but an isolated vitamin E has some risks. But I think that vitamin A, acetyl palmitate, and retinol palmitate in supplements also seems to be extremely risky. Um, so the first thing is, is that we're, we're somewhat cautious at um, being conservative in our use of supplements because there's some history of having used synthetic supplemental ingredients especially when using an isolated nutrient in high amounts that can be cancer promoting, and particularly when those nutrients are widely available in, the, in plant foods in high amounts already. We get tons of folate in fruits and vegetables. We get, we get all the conversion from all the various carotenoids into, into, um, into vitamin A adequately. It's easy to overshoot those things. Okay, that, that said, what I'm, the, what I'm saying right now 
is that there's an optimal level for most nutrients, and we need a wide variety of nutrients, but being deficient in something is almost never, or having suboptimal levels is not gonna be good for our health. And having excessive amounts of a nutrient is not gonna be good for our health either. For many nutrients, there's a sweet spot in the center where we seem to get the best results long term. And if we use vitamin D as an example, there are, that vitamin D deficiency with severe vitamin D um, insufficiency or deficiency exists in my medical practice. I've seen people with vitamin D levels of eight and 10 and 12 and 15, and not only with levels that low, but I've also seen people with severe, severe issues because of their level being that low. So, but the amount a person needs, but also we see issues and have studies that show that excessive amounts of vitamin D given by many endocrinologists taking 30,000, 50,000 units in, you know, a week or even 10,000, particularly vitamin D2, which is synthetic, can have negative effects. So we have to be conservative in our recommendations and not think that we're gonna, and we have to rely, rely on food to get most of what we need. That said, if our diet is strictly vegan, there may be some nutrients like vitamin B12. Vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. We live indoors and some people have a higher need for it than others, but then we should use a conservative amount and not push it too high. The um, EPA and DHA, particularly DHA, is the omega-3 fatty acid that varies considerably from person to person in the ability of the conversion enzymes to make the adequate levels. When we look at most of the studies on cognitive impairment or brain shrinkage with omega-3 index, they all seem to show similar evidence that levels below five um, are not as does not lead to brain fullness and as much cognitive health as levels above five. But when we see levels dropping below four on the omega-3 index, we see consistently across the board that we get what we see brain shrinkage and cognitive impairment. So luckily, in today's society, we do have modern ability to take a person's blood test and see if their levels are coming too low, and we can adjust them accordingly. So using supplements conservatively, we do have an opportunity to be more precise and to make sure people don't get in trouble. There's even recent evidence to suggest that too much B12 may not be as benign as we thought it was. But then again, a deficiency is still bad. We don't wanna just assume because we're protecting people against B12 that giving people 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams of B12 a day is harmless because it may not be for certain people. So I'm saying that these things are in transition, but we have a lot of information available to, um, to target our advice to make sure people are safe and get the right amount of nutrients they need. And there is also some, inf and for example, iodine's another one. Now you don't need to eat animal products to get iodine. There's iodine in seaweeds and certain vegetables, but some people not eating seaweeds may be better off with some iodine exposure in their, in their diet or in their supplement. So we just gotta be sensi sensible, be conservative, and just like with the diet high in animal products, they have a lot of things they're, they're, they need some, they're not getting enough of, and we're trying to optimize exposure to all nutrients in a way that's, mo that's most conservative and safest based on as much review of the scientific data we have available today. It's a broad overview. Okay, one of the, regarding whole food plant-based diets, it seems to make an incredible amount of sense regarding weight loss, heart disease, stroke, um, seems to make perfect sense. But the question of blood sugar or type two, di type two diabetes seems a little less clear because fruit and lots of beans and whole grains and sweet potatoes does seem like it could raise and does raise your blood sugar. So if you take a glucometer and me measure your blood sugar every day, it does go up if you eat a giant bowl of chickpeas and quinoa and sweet potatoes. So um, is, if you're fighting type two diabetes or pre-diabetes, should you cut down some, I mean the greens I know don't affect it, but should you keep your portions of cooked beans, whole grains, potatoes, squashes, down, and fruits down somewhat, or is that not a concern? So if your goal is to actually correct the diabetes, you have to correct the insulin resistance that causes the diabetes. And as Dr. Furman mentioned earlier, the things you, you do that have short-term facility don't necessarily have anything to do with getting well. 
Um, what our observation has certainly been, if you are a type 2 diabetic and you're willing to do really dangerous and radical things like eat well and exercise, go to bed on time, um, the vast majority of people will be able to uh, improve the condition mostly uh, to the point where they can eliminate the need for medication and normalize their blood sugar levels. And you're going to do that with a whole plant food SOS free diet, abundant sleep and regular exercise. Now it's true that some foods are going to push your short term sugars higher than others. Uh, fresh fruits, uh, uh, grains may have a higher uh, glycemic response than would be beans or vegetable materials. And so if your concern is regulating short term blood sugar levels, then you would go on as much uh, uh, green vegetable food, salads, steamed vegetables, uh, beans, things that have a lower glycemic response, and you'd maybe minimize or avoid the fruits or other, especially the, uh, any type of processed foods. If you do that long enough to achieve optimum weight, you're, you're likely to find yourself optimizing blood sugar levels, and often to the point where you can become much more flexible with your diet and still maintain desirable sugar levels. So short term, you can certainly play around with glycemic response of individual foods. Long term, it may become academic because once you, once you normalize your blood sugar levels, you can eat a whole plant food SOS free diet, usually with reasonable abandon. Um, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just add one thing. Let's assume that I'm on a keto diet now and I'm eating animal products to control my sugars. But because I'm not eating much fruit or grains in the diet and I'm eating mostly meat or things that don't have glucose in them. Well, that, um, the saturated fat and the high exposure to the hormones from animal products deforms the insulin receptors. And actually, there's the, they're called cavalins and cavins, where the, which are the spaces in the cells that house the insulin receptor. And they change in shape when the membrane of the cell gets, when the fat in the, in the mem cell membrane gets more saturated from animal product consumption. So now when this person on a keto diet is controlling their sugars from avoiding animal products, they've made their body more insulin resistant. And now if they have a piece of fruit, they're going to spike their sugar way up through the roof. Or if they have a, sweet, you know, a piece of butternut squash or something, they'll have a high glucose and they'll say, look, told you, when I have those foods, my sugar goes through the roof. Yeah, but you're, on an animal, you're eating all this fat, saturated fat on your diet, so you've ruined, you, you, you ruined your cell membranes and you've ruined your insulin receptors. We have to, so what we're talking here is restoring integrity to the cell membranes, to the insulin receptors, and to the immune, and to immune function, T, to the T cell function. In other words, the body works as a unit. And diabetes is a disease of inflammation, of insulin resistance, of extra body fat, of, of, a, of lack of phytonutrients. So there's a whole bunch of factors involved. And we've found that utilizing this plant-based approach that is, glyce is also glycemically favorable, we're not feeding people processed foods and white flour and white rice and things like that. And also, the, we're keeping the, we're, the oils we use, I should have said that wrong, the fats we use contain full fiber with them, so the fats are absorbing into the bloodstream very slowly. When you put oils in the diet, the fats get absorbed very rapidly in the bloodstream. And then the fat interferes with insulin, makes you more insulin resistant at the same time. So the fact that the diet is oil-free, high in fiber, and, um, and we're burning the calories used for, we're, use, we're burning the calories off as we use, for our basic metabolic needs, we're not storing them as fat, which changes the metabolic processes of the body. Let me give you an example. I tell people who come to my clinic that when they're on the program and they're overweight, if they're not losing two pounds a week, if they're more than 30 pounds overweight, that is, then they're not on the program. Because a person that's overweight has extra cytokines and lipokines being eliminated from the fat supply, they've got insulin resistance, but we see even if the person is still overweight, if they're following the diet carefully and they're dropping weight, their insulin resistance comes down while they're still overweight. Their amount of estrogen production comes down while they're still overweight. These, we, we see benefits coming, improving while they're still overweight because they're eating right and dropping their weight and their insulin receptors are being fixed. Oh, thank you. Um, I think I summed up an, uh, uh, enough right now, and our, our group experience is that our joy is taking care of thousands of people with diabetes and heart disease in these conditions and watching their diabetes go away, and the skills we've developed as physicians is knowing how much to cut back on the insulin needs of a type 1 when they switch this way of eating, 
How fast should we take the medications off? How, which medications come off first? That's the specialty over the last three decades that we've developed to be able to know predictively how much the person is going to improve from the diet that we prescribe and the effects that we see in practice are incredibly rewarding and miraculous for both the, both the patient and the doctor, and that's why we're so thrilled and excited about what we do. Part of the problem with diabetics is that they're taught to monitor their blood glucose levels and to focus on just that and keeping them stable all the time. And it doesn't matter what strategy they use to get there. It can be drugs. So, and, and of course, what you pointed out is, is really true. A lot of these people coming off of keto and paleo diets, their glucose levels are going to be all over the place. And sometimes that's the price you have to pay until the body learns how to regulate itself differently. So this is a very scary thing for a type 2 diabetic, for example, who starts eating a whole foods plant-based diet with butternut squash and bananas and other foods. And, and first of all, coming off of a keto diet or a paleo diet, they love this. I've had people hug me in the office. You mean I can have fruit and I can have potatoes? And yes, you can. Um, but the, the thing you have to keep talking to them about is not being so concerned at their varying glucose levels because their body's going to take some time to learn how to regulate itself. So the choices are, like Dr. Goldhammer said, you take a walk on the wild side and eat good food and sleep and drink water and exercise, and things are gonna be unpredictable for a while. But at the end, you're gonna reach a point where if you're a type two diabetic, you're probably gonna be a former type two diabetic, or you continue this moment to moment, hour to hour, tightly controlled regulation, which causes you to make very bad decisions about drugs and food choices for, momentary, for a momentary um, uh, feeling of, of peace and calm that's really very disingenuous because if you look at the long-term results for people who manage their diabetic condition this way, in the long term, it's horrible. People who take drugs as their doctors prescribe will continue to gain weight, their diabetes will continue to progress, and they will almost all end up insulin dependent if they live long enough in, in, in this way. So um, it is unpredictable, it's scary for them, but it's the better choice in my opinion, although everybody has to make their own choice about it. Um, I'd like to share a little anecdote that kind of illustrates everything that everyone here has been talking about. I had a patient by the name of Kathy who, when I started taking care of her, she had been diagnosed with diabetes for 17 years, and she had really bad, poorly controlled diabetes. She was on uh, doses of 70-30 insulin twice a day, uh, 20 plus units, and she was taking uh, 10 milligrams of Glucotrol XL uh, once a day, and still her blood sugars were averaging two to three hundreds. Uh, she had claudication so bad she had become disabled, couldn't walk a block without uh, being in excruciating pain. And make a long story short, she came, uh, she became my patient, talked to her about changing her diet. Kathy went vegan overnight, actually really surprised me. And over the next eight to 12 weeks, I had to wean her off all of her diabetes medicines, one after another, because she would call me up and say, Dr. Mills, my blood sugar is 60. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we're gonna <laughs> cut this down. We're gonna stop this. But the one thing I kept telling her was that, you know, I wanted her to eat this whole food, plant-based diet, and I said, I want you to eat fresh fruit. And she would say, no, because it's going to make my blood sugar spike. Because that's what she had been told her entire life as a diabetic. <coughs> and I kept saying, no, Kathy, I want you to get those antioxidants. I want you to eat some fresh fruit. So we went back and forth, back and forth, and finally, she got angry with me. And so she decided that she was going to eat some strawberries to make her blood sugar go up, to prove to me that she couldn't eat uh, 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 fruit to get me off her back. And she uh, called me one night. She was so excited. She was almost in tears. She's like, Dr. Mills, I had a bowl of strawberries and my sugar didn't spike. Like, I told you, fresh fruit has fiber. Your body has remade itself. You can now eat whole plant foods without a problem. Again, as my colleagues pointed out, it takes time for the body to remake itself. But when you do that, you will be able to eat a whole food, plant-based diet, and fresh fruit as part of that. So, I, uh, a couple months ago, I was, went to Texas to give a presentation at a continuing med ed seminar for one of the medical schools there. And, um, you know, it was 250 physicians uh, that treat diabetic patients. And they're serving 
you know, the pulled pork sandwiches and the chocolate cake had trouble. There really wasn't anything to eat except the table decoration. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I did my presentation and a number of doctors came up to me afterwards and one of them I remember saying, you know, I've been in practice 25 years. I've never had a diabetic get well. <clears throat> so he's telling me his entire practice career, he's never actually seen a diabetic normalize their blood sugar levels. And, and so he was just absolutely amazed the idea that that, that could actually happen. And, and the, the reality though is if you're a type 2 diabetic and you're willing to apply these principles and you do it intelligently, there's a very good chance you're going to notice such dramatic improvement that maybe your physician will also have an opportunity to see at least one patient get well. Um, what's been really rewarding for me is that a lot of endocrinologists and diabetologists order my book, The End of Diabetes, they buy them in bulk for their practices. Yeah and they give them to ways of their patients with diabetes. So it's just really been, um, so that's been somewhat very rewarding to see doctors utilizing that, you know. Um, so it's cool, but so, loud, so what, we're also, what I'm also seeing is that there are more doctors in the last five years across the country that are in agreement and utilizing our, these techniques more than ever before. So in the real world, in your practices, you see real patients who have obesity, diabetes, and other health conditions. What happens? Are you saying that of the last thousand people you saw, every one of them is perfectly healthy, no longer has blood sugar issues, no longer has weight issues? What is the reality of the, of the real world? Because I bump into people that go, oh, I tried plant-based, it didn't work for me, or someone writes something negative online. And so when people follow it correctly, um, what is your experience? So does it sometimes not work? What, what is the actual results from your last 10 years of practice? Well, I think the first thing in a community setting like what I'm in, um, I think Dr. Mills is pretty similar and Dr. Furman, you're getting people from everywhere. And they show up with varying levels of motivation and that's, that's a major factor. How motivated are you? And people have complicated lives. You know, a lot of people have spouses that try to undermine them. And so I think we have to recognize the challenge of working through the barriers to people doing this. And I, I think that's an important part of what we spend time on in our office. I, I don't really find anybody who attends our classes or talks to me and says, gosh, I just intellectually can't understand what you're saying. We don't have that, but we do have people that are very challenged. They have um, jobs, like nurses have jobs where they don't get breaks to eat. We have to work around that. They can't quit their job, you know? So, so I think the barriers and the motivation level can have a lot to do with how, who succeeds and who doesn't. I think the second thing is that um, the documentaries and everything have been great, I, and I, I'm glad to see there are so many more coming out. But we have this new phenomenon now with people binge watching documentaries over the weekend, wake up on Monday, I'm gonna be plant-based, and they go get um, plant-based sausage and plant-based fake eggs, and then they get those fruit juice sweetened cookies. I mean, they really don't understand what a whole foods diet looks like. Um, and that leads to, sometimes they figure out that's not the right thing to do, but we get people coming in and their food journal, what it looks like is they are avoiding animal foods, but they don't know what to eat instead. So they're piecing around, like the, the people will say, I ate a banana for breakfast and I was still hungry. I'm sure you were, <laughs> because that's not enough food. Well, I used to eat bacon and eggs for breakfast, so Banana sounded good. So my point is, I think people need some help adopting the diet and doing it correctly. And I also think that they need some help in sitting down to figure out what's our implementation plan here. How we, there's always an answer. I mean, I'm pretty creative. I can think of a way to do something with almost anybody's circumstances. But when you send people home and they're all psyched up about this and you don't take the time to do that, I think that becomes a barrier to success and people can get very discouraged. So I think that's some of the variability that you might be seeing. I, I, I would agree with that 100%. And um, we've all heard the apocryphal, apocryphal story of, oh, I went plant-based but I was so tired and I was so weak, I felt like I was gonna die. And finally, I had to have a piece of meat. And then I felt, I felt better immediately. Well, the stuff was still in your stomach, so how could you feel better immediately? That was all psychological. But when I hear these stories, I ask the people, okay, what were you eating? And invariably, you guys tell me, what were they eating? 
Yeah, maybe. No, but they, they were doing a little bit better than that. Actually, they were eating salads and stir fry. And I tell them, there's your problem. Salads and stir fry, wonderful foods, but they're water and fiber and no calories. It's great if you're a rabbit, because rabbits weigh three pounds. But you <laughs> are a human being, and human beings need calories. You need to eat food that is going to give your body enough calories and nutrients to make it through the day. My mantra is this, and I want you guys to memorize this. Going plant-based is like having sex. If you didn't enjoy it, you weren't doing it right. Okay? <laughs> because when you do plant-based right, your story's like Gary. You wake up saying, my God, I feel great. And, and if you don't have that experience, you're not doing something properly. I had a guy um, with diabetes who was coming into the free clinic, and his blood sugars were terrible all over the place. And people have started writing in his uh, chart, non-compliant, you know, da 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 except that this guy was very faithful, would bring in his little book with all his blood sugars, and he never missed an appointment. The problem was he was Spanish-speaking only. And whenever he came in, there was no interpreter. So people would go in and talk loudly to him as though that was going to make him understand English. <laughs> <laughs> but he really didn't understand what he was expected to do. I insisted we get an interpreter, sat down and talked to him about not eating a greasy spoon joints. He was a truck driver. That that's gonna make his insulin, uh, his, blood, his medicines not work. It's gonna make his blood sugar go all over the place. He's gotta start being more plant-based, taking food with him. Next time that guy came to clinic, his, his blood sugar record was beautiful. So as Pam said, it's all about making sure that people have the tools for success and that we're not setting them up for failure. That we take that energy and drive and, and, and that they have and channel it properly so that they can succeed at what they really want to do. I'll just add a, um, one or two little things, is that we all have um, our difficulties over our careers with people who know what to do, want to do it, and can't do it, and don't do it, don't eat healthy. And it's not about plant-based or anything like that. It's about, it's usually, usually the, the things that drive addictions and people's inability to eat healthy is usually their addictions to sweets, and their addiction to oil, and their addictions to salt, and it's, and it's this all mixed up. And so it's not just they're eating meat, they're also eating processed foods and, and, and you know, honey and all kinds of sweeteners and, and they're eating too much salt in their diet. So we are asking a lot of people. We're asking them to make a radical change in the way they, and it, and it affects their taste buds because their high levels of being acclimated to sweet foods have deadened their taste for, for the natural good taste of a berry that's not as sweet. And they're salting their food so they can't taste vegetables anymore. And they've had the oil, so they can't, you know, so in other words, they're used to the caloric rush of entering the bloodstream, and they're almost getting high off these foods. And so over the years, I think that we've addressed a lot of our, the style of our practices to help people remove the obstacles to healing. And, you know, with, with, with having courses and, and professionals that specialize in food addiction and opportunities where people get support system and get support and get information and get targeted ad addressing those concerns and what to do. And, and so whether it's web support or whether it's coming away to a place where they can get, be there long term and, and be away from their addictions to staying long enough or, but, or what, whether it's getting um, into the, a Zoom conference into their home or whether it's setting up with diet buddies or setting up with, with partners in their communities and, and, and um, what are they called, dinner meetups and things. So in other words, we're in, we've tried to utilize in our, in our professional life or um, offering services that help people get over their addictions and increase the probability and likelihood they're going to stay with this long term and have really good understanding of those obstacles that might have derailed them in the past and made them fail being successful on a diet. And we've become better at this over the decades. At, at doing this and developing these skills with people. So it's complicated because people are complicated and they've been derailed in all different directions and we're trying to help them as best as we can. So <clears throat> if the question is, if you have a diabetic patient who's C-peptide suggests taking insulin and they're willing to do the diet and lifestyle factors long enough to achieve optimum weight, 
what percentage of those are not going to be able to achieve uh, more normal blood sugar levels, and it's an exception. So if you can control people's behavior long enough, you're going to expect that the majority of diabetics are going to be able to achieve, of type 2 diabetics are going to achieve normal or more normal blood sugar levels and eliminate the need for medication. Now, what percentage of people can you get to do that? It's the same question you ask about obesity. Like, how many people that are obese do you think, if they adopt a whole plant food SOS-free diet, get moderate exercise and adequate sleep, will not lose weight? You know, it's, it, 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 you just don't see it. They're going to lose weight. And the average weight loss uh, for a male is about three pounds a week, for a female about two pounds a week in my experience. And so some people, do some people lose slower? Yes, there are some people that lose weight at a slower rate than others because it's a bell curve. But I don't have anybody so far that can't achieve um, a weight loss if they're willing to do enough of these different things. The, the problem is some people have to work a lot harder at it than others because they got more, like you mentioned, more roadblocks, more challenges, less support. But it, don't confuse that with the fact that a whole plant food SOS-free diet won't help type 2 diabetics achieve normal blood sugar levels. Different issue. Can I ask my colleague something? Because I get asked this a lot by patients. They say, well, how should I do this? Should I just wean off things slowly, or should I just try and cut everything off you know, all at once? I'll tell you what my bias is. I tell them, you're going to have to lay on the floor kick, scream, and just roll around until you get over it. In other words, you need to go cold turkey. That's my bias. But what do you guys feel? Um, I, I agree because when we, I, I always discuss this with people all the time, that when you have a foot in both worlds, it puts you under more stress and makes it more difficult because you don't see the miraculous benefits from doing it all the way. And you also, the keeping, continuing to have those triggers keep you always, your addictions going and make you want to have more of the bad stuff. A little bit leads to more and, wanting, and continuing to want that. And also, it makes you, it, you never really get your taste buds acclimated or your body changed over to really get to, to like this more. So, I, so, I, so I'm, over the, over the years, in the, the way I've modified my advice to a degree over the years is actually to insist on abstinence and to become more strict in making sure people comply with everything I want because if I can get them to link together enough months of doing that, it gets easier for them to stay with this and want to do it long term. It actually makes it more difficult when they, when they keep going back into the old way and thinking that's going to help them and baby steps and all this baby step stuff and the cheat diet and all this stuff. It, you, you, get, you get more, pe more recidivism that way than just insisting that abstinence works, this way of eating is addicting, and when you get a person off cocaine, you don't have them going back on cocaine on weekends. And when you want a person to <laughs> come off the alcohol, you don't go and have them go, go to the bar and having, and having drinks. You want them to stay away from the alcohol. They have a better chance of staying away from it long term. Um, I agree. I, you know, our diet is a little bit different than some others, but it's a pretty radical change for most people. And I think that the, the problem with people, I think prescriptive communication is needed. And I've used this example a lot. You know, when people go to the pharmacy and pick up a prescription, the pharmacist doesn't hand it to them and say, here's some drugs, um, take some, not too many, okay? I mean, it's very specific. You're gonna take one with food three times a day at no more than, no less than six hours apart. But it's very specific and people know what to do. So when you get into this baby steps thing and um, let's do, let's drink water this week and then, uh, well, first of all, all the bad stuff's still in the house and that's a temptation. And it leads to this, and I see this in people who try to do this on their own, they keep thinking that they're doing better while they're not. And I, I teach by analogy, so I, told, I started using this with my folks. I mean, I tell them, listen, you know, right now, you keep saying you're getting a little bit better, but it's sort of like last year I filed my tax return in December and the penalties and fees and everything were awful. This year I'm doing so much better because I did it at Thanksgiving. Okay, so, so I saved $10 in fines, yeah. but, but you were still late. And here's the deal, you gotta turn that thing in on April 15th, right? We got, that is the hard date. So people delude themselves 
into thinking that they're doing better. They do it with exercise, they do it with food. And so I think that there's room for people to adopt this diet in different ways, provided that it's prescriptive and there are benchmarks and the expectations are very clear and the communication is prescriptive and we're gonna measure progress on adherence to some kind of standard. They'll be better off, that's what they're coming to us for. They're not coming to us for them to, you know, they don't come to us for us to say, well, whatever you want to do this week. I tell my people at the office, we're not letting the, the inmates run the asylum here, okay? We're <laughs> going we're gonna to be the people that drive the process because we're the people who have some experience in doing it, so. Um, in the past, I believe, Pam, when people asked you about plant-based diets, you recommended it, but you didn't insist that people were 100% vegan. And Dr. Furman, I believe the same, I don't know how many years ago. If someone came to you today and said, what should I eat? Do you tell them they need to be 100% plant-based? Or do you say, well, what exactly do you say? Do they have to be 100% plant-based? Or do you say they could have animal products in some amount? You and Dr. Furman, yes. Um, we don't recommend 100% plant-based diet as our general recommendation. Um, the blue zones, plenty of people out there living to 100 don't eat a vegan diet. I'm vegan, I'm a pretty public vegan, and, and so it's a choice that I made. But one of the things that, that I recognized when I started my business 25 years ago is the difference between buzz and traction. Traction is when you're actually gaining traction in the marketplace. And ours is a membership organization. So we see what happens to people over a long period of time, a lot of them, in a lot of different states of health and different states of motivation and everything else. So our idea is we start with a diet that we know is health promoting that results in people getting well. I mean, the CHIP program has never been vegan and there are 26 articles published in medical journals with the CHIP program showing that people reverse their cardiovascular disease and their diabetes. Ornish's program was not vegan in the beginning, and I'm not, I'm not sure it still is. And he has published studies showing that, that, he, uh, that these patients get better, even prostate cancer patients. So we start with that. Some people become what I call the accidental vegans. They make up their mind to do it later on. But what we've seen in 25 years is we have seen people who are able to sustain what is, by most standards, a pretty radical diet change for very long periods of time that isn't perfect. And that, to me, is more important than perfection for a few weeks and cycling in and out of the perfection. In fact, that most of the people coming to us right now have been making attempts to do this and part of the problem is not knowing what to do and being on medications they shouldn't have been on, but a lot of the problem is that they hold themselves to a standard which they can't seem to achieve and maintain, and then they fail, and then they cycle through and they start again. And that's the cycle we're trying to prevent and pull people out of. So, um, so that's, that's what we're doing. I would rather see less perfection and longer sustainability. And by the way, our people get well too. Um, we have lots, I mean, thousands of people. We've worked with over 100,000 people in 33 countries. And our track record and our files are filled with people who eat less than perfect diets who are doing very, very well in terms of low numbers, no repeat heart attacks, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my... Well, um, I've written books and I've um, put out television shows and... Um, I do advocate a diet that's um, nutrient-rich and, and plant-based, but a really, um, it's plant-dense and plant-rich, but I do have said to people that they don't have to do it strictly on a vegan diet. They could use animal products as a condiment a few times a week, just a few ounces here and there, but I don't advocate that. It's that I, it's that I don't want to turn a person off from, ju from jumping into this program if they don't want to be vegan at the very beginning. I want to let them know that that's not the critical factor of being a strict vegan is not necessary to enter or begin this process because I want more people to enter it and see how healing this can be. However, when people come to my retreat, who are, and they're usually there for, for a couple of months, and they're not there spending all that money and all that time because they just want to try to eat some healthy food and get some recipes. They're there because they're really very sick. And they're food addicts, and they have obesity, and they have diabetes, and they have heart disease, or they have cancer, or they have psoriasis, or they have, they have, they have serious illnesses. 
And in those cases, we're not, we're not starting people, giving them the option of having a little bit of animal products in their diet. These are people who have serious conditions. And I feel that in those cases, it's like saying to them, do you want to drop 15 pounds this month and maximally reverse your psoriatic arthritis? Or do you want to slow that down and only lose, 10, only lose five pounds and maybe not get well? Or do you want to, in other words, if you have your cancer, should we give you all out with everything we can do to make you well, or should we just modify that a little bit? So of course I'm not going to offer that. So, so I, I prefer to offer um, the full vegan nutritarian kind of approach. And I don't offer anything other than that when people come to my retreat, because they're there for a reason, and we want to give them the, what's very best. But in the public outreach, we're going to show people the advantage of doing this all the way. But if they choose not to and want to use an animal product on occasion or in very small amounts, that doesn't have to be dissuade them from entering the program. I, I agree with that. And I think that that's a, an important distinction that we need to make, is that um, if I was running an immersion program like you are, we, I would serve vegan food. I have a commercial kitchen in my place. We don't make any animal food there. We don't serve any animal food there. People know what to do with chicken. They don't need chicken from us, right? So, but there is a difference, and I think you pointed out the crucial difference is that a person who is very sick and motivated, taking the time, that's one thing. People out in the community who we're trying to attract in is another thing. And I think if we lay down the gauntlet and basically say, our tent is very small, and you have to meet all these criteria to enter, I think we scare people away who could be romanced into this if we were not so strict. And some of them never give up animal foods. But again, if they're compliant over a long period of time on an on a excellent diet, better than 99.99999% of the people are eating this country and they're, they're not sick anymore, I'll take that over two weeks of perfection. And then some of them, like I said, they will progress. We call them the accidental vegans. The people come in one day and go, you know what? I can't remember the last time I had chicken. I don't think I care about it anymore. But have we laid down, have we drawn the line in the sand in the beginning? They wouldn't have been there in the first place, and I think that's an important consideration. There are a lot of ways to start the pathway to health-promoting diets. I don't think that the two choices are baby steps or all the way vegan. That's what I call the sucker's choice, where you put two options that don't work for somebody down on the table and ask them to pick. All right, so why don't we look at the middle as a place where we can meet the public where they are and start drawing them in. And they often get attracted to what they see. But if we don't get them in, they're not going to be attracted to anything. So you know, this brings up the issue uh, that we talk about in our book, The Pleasure Trap, the difference between the pleasure trap and the ego trap. You know, the pleasure trap we all recognize, you have a little bit, you want a lot. You don't tell alcoholics just to drink beer and wine, even though they'd like it, and you get more people to attend your quit drinking seminars. But we know over the long run, if they drink too much beer and wine, they're not going to be successful. So I don't disagree with either of you that offering a broad scale inclusive program to help people improve their health is the way to go. But it's not because of the meat, it's in spite of the meat that they're getting the tremendous results that they do in your programs. Um, if a person's vulnerable to the pleasure trap, if they're an alcoholic, they know they can't have just a little bit. They've got to stop drinking. We, we don't kid ourselves that you can have alcoholics be successful and continue to drink. And for some people, if they're struggling with overweight or various diseases, they may not be able to have a little bit and get the result that they want with their health. And so for those people, we try to explain to them they've got to take a, a much stricter approach in order to get well. Um, at the True North Health Center, where we have a controlled environment, or Dr. Furman's facilities where we have a controlled environment, it's relatively easy to enforce that. Um, if you have a person that's vulnerable to the ego trap, though, where they don't want to even get started, or they get started, but they won't continue because they can't be perfect, um, that can be a, a, a serious impediment to their long-term success. And so if we're trying to come up with a realistic, inclusive program that allows them to be successful, even if not perfect, certainly is reasonable. Unfortunately, not everybody can be successful in that because of the pleasure trap vulnerability. And for somebody that's vulnerable to both the pleasure trap and the ego trap, they have a very difficult path to uh, follow and be successful with, which is why you'll see a very high failure rate amongst people that attempt to do that when they're vulnerable to both of those uh, variables. In fact, we're doing a study right now at True North Health Center on 
adherence, really validating a questionnaire, looking at these optimized diets, figuring out what people do, and how to support those people that do struggle with compliance. This is really probably the greatest challenge that we're all going to face, because we all up here know how to get people well. If the patients come to the center, the vast majority of the people that we ex uh, accept will get well. When they go home, sometimes they falter. So I've decided I'm going to not let them go home anymore. <laughs> what? <laughs> one, one other thing I'll add, and, and Alan, you made such a good point. Actually, everybody's making such good points about this, is that you know, one of the things that's wrong with medicine is one size fits all. People complain it to, about it to me all the time. You know, I, I go to see my doctor, he looks at my lab results. You have this cholesterol, you get this statin drug. I mean, everything is very formulaic. Nobody's thinking, nobody's talking to anybody. And I think it's important for us to not do that. And so when, Alan, when you were talking about um, people who have addictive personalities and that sort of thing, I, I agree 100%. But you know, let's take the alcohol issue, for example. Somebody could tell me alcohol is bad for you. People become alcoholics and they wreck their cars and they lose their jobs and you know, they beat up their wives and they go bankrupt. Okay, very true. I had 10 glasses of wine last year, so I don't know why you're telling me that. Okay, so the point that I'm making is that I think it's important that we take into consideration the person we're working with. Aren't, isn't one of the things we're advertising is we're completely the opposite of everything medical out there? So we're dealing with people and their situations. That's what the barrier discussions are all about because when people tell me things in my office that keep them from doing this that are just amazing. I have a guy whose wife's bringing home potato chips and gumdrops and putting them on the coffee table trying to tempt him to eat bad food because she doesn't like him. I mean, and of course what you want to say is leave her, but you can't do that, right? So, so the, the point is that we're trying to be not the standardized thing where there's one size fits all, we don't care who you are, what your background is, what your problems are, everybody does the same thing. So I think there's room for these variations that we're talking about. We have to listen to what people are saying to us and figure out how we're going to help them. And part of it is not having a one-size-fits-all mentality. And I think some of the distinctions that have been made here are really, really good. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is that when patients ask me what I think they should do, I tell them that I am absolutely convinced that an entirely plant-based diet is the healthiest diet that any human can consume. Now, I will tell them that I have scientific evidence that a mostly plant-based diet is healthy. I don't have the data that can absolutely prove that a strictly plant-based diet is, uh, uh, will uh, be proved better than a mostly plant-based diet, but clearly that's where the evidence is pointing, and that it would be best for them to become entire, you know, to eliminate all animal foods from their diet. How dogmatic I am about uh, emphasizing that depends on how sick they are. If there's somebody that's dealing with cancer or an autoimmune disease, I'm, I'm pretty dogmatic. I'm like, you got to leave this crap alone because it's killing you. And if you don't, it's going to kill you. Um, if there's somebody who's doing it because they want to get healthier, they want to live better, I'm like, this is what our goal is. But the, the other thing that I really do emphasize to them is that when you were learning to walk and you fell on your butt, did you sit there and cry? No, you got up and you start walking again. So the fact is, yeah, you may slip and eat something you didn't want to or you know you shouldn't have, but that doesn't mean you throw in the towel and you give up. You say, okay, I screwed up, but I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna keep going. And that's the key thing, to keep going and not give up. So I'd like to ask you uh, three questions in, on a similar topic. Number one, what does an adult moose eat to grow a rack of antlers in about three months that weigh about 85 pounds and are made out of solid bone? Number two, why is cow's milk high in calcium if cows don't drink milk? Where do cows get their calcium from? Number three, does dairy give us stronger bones? And number four, how do we avoid osteoporosis or brittle bones? Uh, 
God, we look like those people in an old scope commercial passing the bottle around. Okay. <laughs> um, clearly, uh, okay. I love the the the, the um, question about the moose antlers because, um, uh, Alan, you're about six feet, right? If we like flayed him and took all the meat and skin off his skeleton, his skeleton would weigh about 25 pounds, and it took him 20 years to get that skeleton. But a moose can grow antlers made out of solid bone in three months that weigh 85 pounds, eating nothing but green plants. Proof positive, there's plenty of calcium in green plants. That's kind of cool about the moose thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning new things here on this panel. <laughs> Because I was just in Wyoming like two weeks ago, and I was actually in a store looking at all these antlers, and I was like hitting them and going, that was like a rock, that's like rock hard. It's like they carry, yeah, it's like amazing. Anyway, all right, well, back to the real world. Um, yes, we're talking here about um, as we age, if we're gonna live longer, and we're gonna push the envelope of human longevity to 95 or 100, we wanna have our full mental faculties intact. We wanna have our musculoskeletal system working and our bones working too, right? And so that's why we think ahead and we do the right things when we're younger to keep our bones protected as we age. And it's not all just about what we eat either. It's about doing, you know, exercising regularly and the right type of exercise. And so it's, it's also about, um, you know, even, even things like alignment. Like for example, if your feet are severely pronated in, it could make you have more, you know, more tibial torsion where your knees go in and that could put more stress on your hip and more likely to have more, um, more weight on the medial tibial condyle and more likely to develop osteoporosis, osteoarthritis of your knee. And so we're just trying to give people um, a holistic approach where they're eating right, they're getting enough, as Alan said, getting enough sleep at night and they're exercising appropriately to maintain the right amount of, of muscle mass and strength as they age. And I'll tell you what I found, that doing this way of eating keeps your youthful vigor and your strength and your stamina and ability to enjoy sports and do the exercises as you get older easily. And our work with athletes also show that we prolong their careers and their enjoyment of, of athletic activity and their bodies don't age as much. So what we're seeing in the conventional society where people get to be a certain age, like 65, and they can't exercise and their bones are gone and their joints are bad and they can't keep them and they start to lose muscle mass and bone mass because you know, of course, that you don't just lose bone mass, you lose muscle mass and bone mass because muscle and bone grow together and they atrophy together. So osteopenia or osteoporosis is not a degree of the, it's not a disease of the bones, it's a degree of the muscles and the bones that that work together and the way we keep our bones strong is by keeping our muscles strong and the way we keep our muscles strong is by keeping healthy so we can keep our muscles strong. So it's a little bit complicated but we, when we do everything right it makes everything else that we put into the mix work better. So if you want to have strong bones, our bones were designed to live as long as or to function as long as we are alive but we don't take care of them very well. And we have t been told, I mean, I used to believe it, milk builds strong bones, right? So I drank milk, made a lot of cheese, and ended up fat, and it <laughs> didn't work out so well for me. But, but the point is that there, I think there are four things you have to do to build strong bones and a strong body. And I agree with what you said, it's really muscles and bones. People who have muscular bodies rarely have crumbling bones. You don't see this in Olympic athletes, for example. So I think exercise is a key because exercise triggers, particularly weight-bearing exercise, triggers the bone remodeling process. Eating a health-promoting diet, including a low-acid residue diet so that your body isn't dissolving your bones to buffer acidity, so a whole foods, plant-based diet, um, sunlight because it helps you produce vitamin D. And your gastrointestinal tract has to be in good shape. I mean, two common causes of thinning bones are celiac disease, gastrointestinal tract not working well, and there's a fix for that. You have to change your diet and probiotics are helpful. And, and taking drugs like, like corticosteroids that damage the microbiome and interfere with absorption of nutrients. So if you take care of those four things, you have a very good chance of of living in your own home independently, 
strong enough to pick something up off the floor and tie your shoes and get something out of the cabinet and um, prepare your own food, not ending up in some kind of nursing home facility until the end of your life. And I think that's what we all really want, is not to end up warehoused someplace. So if you want to keep your independence, that involves a strong musculoskeletal system. I think those are the four most important things to pay attention to. My, uh, my mother, when she turned 92 years old, told me that she realized that she um, had outlived all 52 of her lifelong friends, that they had all died. Many of them used to tease her mercilessly about her diet. <clears throat> and she said, Alan, you need to warn your patients. If they're going to do this diet, make younger friends. <laughs> So I got a call once about a few months ago from someone furious and they said, I just watched Joel Furman's video and he just said to avoid salt and that's not accurate. We absolutely need salt. You need the right kind of salt and if you get the right salt, it's a very important thing and you must have salt and you got to take that, cut, edit that video because it's not true. Salt is important. It's just got to be the right kind of salt. What do you guys think about salt? Name, so I should start out with the answer anyway. I'm, and, I, and I want to say to Alan that my mother's also 93 years old. But, um, and she took her a long time to come around and eat, to eat healthier too, but anyway. Um, so the, yes, um, one, of the, we cons one of the things we consider critical to saving human life on this planet and stopping the vast amount of people dying of heart attacks and strokes is this incredible addiction and craziness we've developed with putting salt, with eating so much salt. I mean, the, the American Heart Association um, recommends that when people have heart disease, they cut their salt intake down to 1,500 milligrams a day, and I'm saying, you mean, I guess we should do that with smokers too. We should, people with lung cancer should cut their lung, should cut their cigarettes back once they find out they have lung cancer. The reason why this doesn't work is because our, the damage from salt occurs insidiously and slowly all through our lives. And salt doesn't just raise our blood pressure. It also damages the endothelial, reduces nitric oxide production, causes inflammation in the, in the interior wall of your blood vessels, causes microvascular hemorrhaging, increasing the risk of autoimmune disease, suppresses T helper cells, increasing the risk of, auto, of autoimmune conditions, increases risk of stomach cancer. What I'm saying it right now is that our bodies are designed to consume the perfect amount of sodium that's in natural foods, and we truly need sodium, but sodium is an ingredient in all natural plants. And I'm also saying that a low-salt diet is not a low-salt diet, it's a high-salt diet. Because the studies on the, 15, the, the American Heart Association recommendations of 1,500 milligrams a day show that death rates go down as they approach 1,500 milligrams a day, yes, but they continue to follow the data, as they go down from 1,500 to 1,000, heart attack rates and stroke rates continue to go down. They don't stop at 1,500 milligrams a day. You know, what I'm also saying that the salt years matter. In other words, if let's say just for example, if we agree that 1,000 milligrams of sodium today is appropriate for most people. Now I know that there are various medical conditions and people who lo urinate, lose more salt in their urine and people with, with pots and all types of diseases that require sodium, but that's not talking about 99% of us who have normal kidney and salt metabolism. For us, 1,000 milligrams a day of sodium is probably the upper limit of normal for our long-term health. So if we go to 2,000 for 10 years, that's, that's 10 salt years. If you go 3,000 a day, that's 2,000 above the rate, the normal amount of 1,000. 3,000 above the normal rate of 1,000 is two salt years. For 50 years of your life, that's 100 salt years. You're going to be at risk of stroke of those 100 salt years if you ate that much salt, 3,000 a day for 50 years. What I'm saying is you're going to pay a price for your lifetime exposure of salt, and it changes your sympathetic tone in your brain. It changes the behavior of your blood vessels. You don't just cut out salt and have these, have these diseases go away. 
When you cut out smoking, it takes 15 years for the damage from smoking to re start to resolve itself. When you cut out salt, it takes years for the damage to go away, not weeks. The reason why we see people cut out salt and they're not do well is because they're waiting till they have advanced heart disease and heart failure, and then they cut out salt, and they're cutting out salt at such a late stage in the pathology that at that point it doesn't matter that much, and they have so much damage from the high salt diet that at that point it is a stress to their system to lower salt that radically. What I'm saying is it's a confusing subject matter, but if we really want to have maximal effects at reducing strokes and, and heart attacks and other diseases, remember that a diet has it, is better not to have an addi any additional salt, any additional salt over and above what's in natural foods, and Himalayan salts, and Celtic salts, and salt from the Rock of Gibraltar, the bottom of the deepest of the sea or the backside of the moon, it doesn't make a difference because they all have 2,200 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon, not per tablespoon, per teaspoon. And when you throw in an extra couple of thousand milligrams of sodium to your body every day, you pay a price. And one more thing, people on vegan diets, on healthy vegan diets can die of hemorrhagic strokes because the type of stroke caused by atherosclerosis and clots are called embolic or ischemic strokes, not hemorrhagic stroke. The atherosclerotic process that increases your risk of a ischemic stroke may add some thickening and protection to the brain, to the fragile blood vessels in the brain as they age against the effects of a high salt diet and high blood pressure, causing rupture of fragile vessels in the brain as people get over uh, on otherwise plant-based diets. For example, in Asian countries, um, in these who eat these high salt diets, there's much, there's 10 times the risk of having a hemorrhagic stroke than there is in the United States where we have eaten burgers and bacon. And also, it's also true that very low cholesterol levels are linked to higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke, not lower risk. What I'm saying right now is that if we want to wipe out all strokes, meaning hemorrhagic strokes and ischemic or embolic strokes, it's not enough to just eat right, we also have to eat right and not salt our food. So you can still have a hemorrhagic stroke on a diet that otherwise is protective against clot or atherosclerosis. I could say much more but I think I'll stop here and let other people comment. So we talk about a whole plant food SOS-free diet. SOS stands for the international symbol of danger, and it includes salt, oil, and sugar. So lots of people are saying, okay, we'll get rid of the oil. Some people get rid of the sugar and refined carbohydrates, but you also have to, as Dr. Furman says, get rid of the salt. Salt does something else in addition to the things that were just mentioned, and that's that it stimulates passive overeating. So even though there's no calories in salt, salt helps make you get fat. And the way that it does that is it stimulates your, your uh, internal mechanisms to eat more. For example, if you uh, take an animal or a human and let them eat to satiety, to where they feel satisfied, they'll eat a certain amount of any product, let's say rice, for example. Take that everything else being equal, that same rice that's been salted, you'll find you'll eat more before you reach satiety. Now, some people say, well, yeah, because it tastes better. Well, of course it tastes better because the salt stimulates dopamine production in the brain, which is the pleasure-seeking neurochemical that comes from this artificial stimulation. So if you want to find out uh, a simple strategy, whatever you're eating, whatever your diet is, just take the salt out and you will find you'll reach satiety at a lower level and you'll tend to overeat less and you'll end up uh, being more successful in, in managing and attacking your obesity. I just want to add one thing is that when you go from a high salt diet to a diet where we just eat natural foods, for all those years, your body was, was trained to excrete large amounts of salt in the urine. And now you have a low, very low sodium diet. Your kidney doesn't all of a sudden have the ability to reclaim and hold on to sodium. It's still putting out excess sodium because it thinks you're on a high sodium diet still. So temporarily, when people switch from a high sodium diet to what I consider, or we consider, an a, a normal sodium diet, which is much lower in sodium about, most natural foods don't have more than half the amount of calories, half the amount of sodium as it does calories. That is, we're eating 1,500 calories a day, we're not taking in more than 700 milligrams of sodium a day in our diet. If we're taking in 2,000 milligrams of, 2,000 calories a day, our diet is having less than usually 900 milligrams of sodium in it, because natural foods don't have, have that amount of sodium. What I'm saying right now, is that temporarily you can become a little hyponatremic and a little fatigued and your blood, vessel, your blood um, may be low in sodium because your body takes a few weeks to be able to hold on to sodium more normally after being on a high salt diet for so long. But the advantage of that 
is once you're on a very low sodium diet for a long period of time, you stop losing salt in your urine and you don't lose salt in your sweat. So that when you go out and play tennis in the more basketball, I'm saying tennis, I'm saying basketball to accommodate Alan, because I'm a tennis player, he's a basketball player. And we're sweating in 90 degree heat, we tolerate the heat better. We can play and sweat in the summer and it doesn't bother us. And we're not wiped out afterwards because we're not losing sodium in our sweat. We can run and we can do stuff because our body is, whole, is not pushing sodium out all over the place. So we have a huge benefit of being stable and being acclimated to a lower sodium diet, which takes time, but the benefits are worth it. Okay, so I'll welcome you to my world where our people, and first of all, I will agree with you, there is a, there is a population of people who should have no salt. Um, and, and for some people, it really quickly spikes their blood pressure. I totally agree that, that there is a population of people who should have no added salt. But we're dealing with people who are coming into our office and they've gained 25 pounds and their cholesterol is 190. And so what you have to look at is what level of restriction can you apply to these people and get them to come back, okay? And, and we're, my place isn't residential. They go home and, and have to do this. And a lot of our people are all over the country. We're not even seeing them face to face. So I think the practicality, I mean, if you look at, at salt restriction as a public health policy, the World Health Organization, the American Heart Association, they will all tell you it's 99.9% .9 fail, failure rate. So I'm not disputing that some people should eat no salt, but I think, again, we have just got to expand our horizons a little bit to say that there's only so much in, uh, so much restriction that you can do with some people and get them to play ball with you. And if you lose them all at the gate by drawing the line in the sand, you, you win the battle, but you lose the war. We have got to find a way, you guys, to get hundreds of millions of people to do this. And it isn't going to happen with what's going on right now. We're gonna to have to reach out there and get people who, who are willing to do this. So I think we have a, we have a compliance issue, a willingness issue, and we have a necessity issue. I come back to the question we're always asking ourselves. What is the level of restriction that we need to impose upon this person to get them moving forward with their health? And then we can hope that they do more later. Now, if, they have, if they've had strokes, if they, I mean, I totally get the specific circumstances in which salt restriction, complete salt restriction is necessary. And on the sugar issue, I totally get there are some people who can't ever let it touch their lips because they're going to eat seven dozen donuts. I'm not one of them, okay? So when you're telling somebody like me that, you lose me entirely. And when you lose people like me, you're losing a whole bunch of people because I'm a whole lot more willing than most people are. So, I, I, again, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement with this group. I think what we're trying to do is figure out how to apply this in different sets of circumstances so we can get more people going along with this because if we don't make some faster progress pretty soon, we really are doomed. I mean, financially, we can't afford to take care of all the sick people. And the cost to us in terms of lost brain power, manpower, I mean, the workforce is going to hell. We have a lot of problems related to people's poor state of health. So we're gonna have to figure out how to make this quadruple every year rather than this very tiny incremental growth that's going on. So that's my I appreciate the idea that you, know, you want to get people in the door, but the reality is two-thirds of people are overweight or obese. A significant percentage are diabetic. Hypertension is the majority. 30% over people aged 20 are now hypertensive. So 40% over 25. So it's not like there's a whole bunch of normal, healthy people out there and a few sick people that we're trying to apply specialized intervention to. The fact is you have an incredibly sick, addicted population. And although, yes, if you tell alcoholics they can't drink at all, most of them aren't going to be walking in for care. If you tell overweight people that you need to go on a whole plant food SOS free diet, it's going to be hard to get them in the door. It's going to be hard to initiate a program. But the problem is unless we give them a program that actually works long term, we're not going to sustain their interest either. But Alan, you're assuming that everybody is addicted and everybody is on that, that store. I think the difference really is the populations of people we're dealing with. And, they're, and, and not everybody is overweight and pre-diabetic or diabetic because they're addicted to food and they can't stop themselves and the salt makes them eat everything. And some of them just didn't know. I didn't know. I used to be fat. 
I wasn't addicted to anything. I just didn't know that a salad with cheese, ham, egg, and avocado on it wasn't good for you. Okay? I used to, and I thought that, that what you did is you just starved yourself for two months to get into something, you know, get into a dress for an event. That's the way I lived my life. So, so I was a person, and I had, I had cervical dysplasia. I'm the typical client that comes to see me. I used to be, all right? Overweight, should have been scared about a health scare, didn't know that I should have been scared about it because my doctor said, oh, we just cut it out. It's no problem. Everybody gets it. And I believed him. I used to drink the medical Kool-Aid too. So what I didn't need was for somebody to tell me, you know what your problem is? You're an alcohol addict, you're a salt addict, you're a sugar addict. You can't ever have a donut again because it will kill you. Because I, would I, I don't think I ever would have listened to that. That wasn't me. And I keep coming back to what I said earlier. If we are gonna have a one size fits all situation where we're just, we're gonna do what the average cardiologist and endocrinologist is doing out there. This is what we do for people like you. I don't need any information from you. I don't need to know anything about you. I don't need to know anything about how you got into the situation you're in because everybody who is fat and overweight and has these problems, if we don't do it this way, they're not gonna succeed because I don't think that's true. And I think we are just losing people out there when we put that out there as the, as the thing to do. Now, I wanna make one statement in front of everybody. I have sent hundreds of people to you. I think what you do is incredible. So. The not lack of confidence in what you do, totally support it. I've sent people out there who were at addicted, who needed to, some of them have stayed for months. And I've, I've got people coming all the time. You keep threatening the name of building after me and one of these days I'm gonna make you do it. So, so there is room for both of these ideas. That's my point. Um, well, I'd just like to share a couple of fun facts that might be uh, helpful. Uh, there's a reason salt is so seductive for human beings. And the reason is that only herbivores have a taste for and drive to seek out sodium. And that's why cows, deer, and other herbivores actually seek out salt licks. And why is that? It's because the predominant uh, cation in plant foods is actually that's potassium. There's no animals in nature that seek out salt licks. That's a myth. The, uh, deer, deer, and and, and deer and and, and uh, antelope actually do seek uh, sodium-rich mineral deposits, and it's because plant foods are very low in sodium. Now they don't eat it to the point that we do, but they do seek it. And there were studies done back, done back in the 1950s where they took dog chow, artificially depleted it of sodium, and they would put a bowl of salt and a bowl of dog chow out. And the dogs came out every day, dutifully ate their dog chow, and eventually died of hyponatremia because they had nothing in their brain that told them to seek out salt. Why is that? It's because blood is full of sodium. So nature assumes if a carnivore is living, it's living because it's eating other animals. If it's eating other animals, it's going to get plenty of salt. But if you're an herbivore and you're eating plenty of plants, eventually you're going to need to supplement those plants with a little bit of salt. My only point is that's why we like salt. I'm not saying we should be eating as much as we're eating because we shouldn't be. We're overdoing it just like we're overdoing sugar, but that is where that drive to eat and that taste for salt comes from, the fact that we are herbivores. And the fact is that most herbivores do seek sodium. Second thing, our taste buds replace themselves every 21 days. It's a continual process, but roughly every 21 days, they completely replace themselves. The point there is, if somebody is trying to get over a craving, tell them to hang in there, because after about 21 days, their desire for whatever it is they're trying to get over will lessen as their taste buds replenish themselves. I'm, you know, we could have difference of opinion on this, but I think that there's in, you know, in studying the evidence on that, I think that it's not true that herbivores seek out salt licks. And there's, you know, obviously there's hundreds of different species of animals that eat, live on vegetables and the vegetables, including primates. And we're primates and primates don't seek out salt licks or, any, or, or have any history of eating salt or seeking out salt in their diets. So I think that's, um, it's putting the argument in an area that's, that doesn't um, apply to humans.
and isn't even, isn't even realistic. Vegetables are not deficient in sodium. Okay, next questions. Um, Dr. Mills, I have two questions for you, um, and then I'm going to just hold on to them for a second. One, are human beings designed to eat meat? And two, what is wrong with fish and seafood if you can get it from pristine waters? And what about fish oil? And hold on that. And then Dr. Goldhammer, if you could answer, um, if someone is not going to go to your fasting clinic, what would be the ideal water fasting regimen for someone to do from their home? And the second question, is coffee a healthy or unhealthy choice? And hold on to that. And then uh, Dr. Furman, where do you stand on fats such as flax oil, hemp oil, olive oil, olives, avocados, and also um, where, um, and then also um, what specifically is wrong with eggs, assuming you buy free-range organic eggs, and what about egg whites? And then Dr. Popper, um, what do you recommend for people with Crohn's, colitis, irritable bowel, celiac, gluten sensitivity, or other gastrointestinal issues? And also, um, what do you think about smoothies? So if you could all answer your two questions. Is that the only questions you had? <laughs> you want us to go on turn? Whatever you like. Okay, well, the first, I think one of the questions directed to me was about coffee. You know, coffee contains a highly addictive nervous system stimulant called caffeine, which I don't think is a health-promoting food. It has, you know, a couple thousand other chemicals in it. I don't think it's a healthy food to eat. I don't recommend uh, patients use it. We certainly don't serve it at True North Health. As far as fasting, tomorrow morning uh, I'm going to be speaking exclusively on this idea of fasting. But what I can say is there's something people can do safely uh, at home, which is fasting every day for about 12 to 16 hours, depending on how you narrow your feeding window. Um, if you don't eat uh, after dinner, say six or seven o'clock, and you don't eat again until morning, it might be nine or 10 or whatever it is, there's a period of fasting every night. That period is gonna range from 12 to 16 hours. Even that period of um, amount of fasting, as I'll demonstrate uh, tomorrow morning, has been associated with positive health outcomes, including increased glycemic control, re reduced incidence of recurrence in breast cancer, et cetera. So ne not eating, particularly three hours before you go to sleep, for example, and uh, doing that on a consistent pattern is associated with better weight control, better health outcomes, regardless of which diet that you tend to be consuming. Okay. All right, let me take the, um, what's wrong? I, first of all, I do not use the term seafood. They're sea animals, they're nobody's food, okay? Um, secondly, well, what's wrong with them? So I'm gonna, you know, y'all know I'm interactive. So I'm gonna ask some questions. What's the natural diet for uh, a horse? What's the natural diet for a cow? What's the natural diet for a giraffe? Leaves. What is the only point in all of those animals' lives when they eat animal protein? When they're babies, exactly. When they are in a rapid growth phase. For herbivorous animals, animal protein is a growth stimulant and signal. It turns on growth genes called TOR genes that um, cause uh, the body to try and enlarge tail cells to start multiplying. It also stimulates the liver to start cranking out something called insulin-like growth factor, which again stimulates cells to try and grow. As an adult, can your cells grow? No. They can form tumors, but they can't grow. And so the problem with animal protein is that it stimulates our cells to try and grow when they are supposed to be in a quiescent phase. And so what ends up happening is they begin to form tumors and some of those tumors are cancerous. Animal protein causes cancer because it, st it turns on growth genes in adults which are in, s in essence oncogenes or cancer causing genes. That is true for beef, chicken, pork, and um, fish flesh. So all animal protein uh, does this, and the reason it does this is because they are very high 
in the essential amino acids. And this is where nutrition got everything completely bass backwards. When people, when nutritionists start looking at plant proteins versus animal proteins, one of the things that they noticed was that the animal proteins had higher levels of essential amino acids. And so they said, you know what? Those animal proteins are higher quality than the plant proteins because they had more essential amino acids. But that was completely wrong. When our body sees those higher levels of the essential amino acids, it interprets that as a signal to try and grow. The plant proteins have more than enough essential amino acids to keep you healthy, but not so much that they turn on these growth genes which end up causing cancer. So in fact, the animal protein sources are of much lower quality for adults because they will cause disease. Now, the question took away one of my favorite reasons for not uh, eating sea animals because they posited something that really can't happen. They say, well, let's assume it was grown in pristine waters. First of all, there are no pristine waters anymore, okay? Um, and what I usually uh, say to people is if you had to eat nothing but lungs, would you eat the lungs from an animal raised in a coal mine? And people say, of course not, because it would be full of coal dust and dirt and soot. Well, that's the problem with raising, eating animals that have been raised in the ocean. The ocean is filthy. It is full of sewage and, and chemical uh, waste and everything we dump in it. And sea animals have to filter it in order to breathe. And that's why their bodies are so loaded with toxins. And when you eat that, you are eating massive amounts of toxic waste because of bioaccumulation. So, we should stay away from it because it's animal protein and it will turn on cancer genes and we need to stay away from it because it's loaded with toxins. I think I was third and you were last. <laughs> um, all right, I, I think I remember some of the questions and I just have to say that, you know, I feel that I may have become a little more strict as I've gotten older with, with what I advocate to people and even to my patients, um, because I really feel that it's an important niche because there's a lot of people marginally making things less strict and telling people they can do all these little compromises. But, but I wanna offer people, and, and some of us do, we choose to, to give people, what, who's offering to those people that want to maximally extend their lifespan, maximally reverse their diseases, maximally not get cancer, maximally not, in other words, we want to have, uh, as our people who are looking to us for advice, to, to answer to them and, and to give them the program that's gonna give them the best opportunity for their life to be as healthy as possible. We're not watering it down to broaden the amount of people that embrace it. Other people can do that. It's not wrong to do that, but some of us have to take the approach of offering people what is really the best thing for people who want to do what's best for themselves. And don't get a watered down information that's trying to attract more people into it. We all could have done that. To, you know, I remember when I first read To Live, the, the, um, the, manufacturer, the publisher, Little Brown, was telling me this could be such a million, you know, such a big, great book if you just water it down a little bit more. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm not looking to make it a best-selling book. If it's a best-selling book, it's probably not going to be a good book because of what the people want isn't what's best anyway. I want to put out something, that, and over the years, of course, it became a best-selling book for a different reason. But of course, the point I'm making is that's a niche we choose to occupy, and we think it's an important niche to occupy. And uh, so, thank you. What's that? <laughs> okay, the, the question about oils versus nuts versus avocado and things like that, that's also an excellent question. Because I think right now that, um, that I, I, even though um, it was just said that, that animal protein can drive cancer and be dangerous, right? Even that was just said. I want to say right now that olive oil and salt can drive cancer and be dangerous also, and people should know that. Because, because oil is a, tells your body to stop losing weight. 
And fat on the body increases risk of cancer, and fat on the body is hormonally unfavorable. And it's not 70% of our population that's overweight, it's 89% of our population that's overweight. They just call it 70% because it's 70, because they use that BMI, 25 is the demarcation line the government uses between normal weight and normal weight. If you use a more favorable BMI where long the people are at 23, then we have 89% of people overweight. And of the 11% that's not overweight in America, about, out of that 11%, about eight of that 11%, 8% out of the 11%, or almost 80% of that, those people are ill because they are alcoholics, they smoke cigarettes, or they have some medical problem that keeps them thin. It's only 2% of Americans that are eat healthy or, and exercise regularly for have a normal weight, by the way. Two per, two and a half percent, actually, that exercise regularly and healthy enough to have a normal weight. So let me say this about the oil. I think every nutritional scientist in the world could not disagree with the fact that walnuts are healthier than walnut oil, and that sesame seeds are healthier than sesame oil, and that avocados are healthier than avocado oil. When you take the fiber out of the fatty food, you automatically make the fat become instantaneously absorbed at a high efficiency. So now the calories enter the bloodstream within three to five minutes instead of within two to three hours. So we're changing the biological nature of the food. And when food enters the bloodstream, it revs up fat storage and you can't have lipolysis and breakdown of fat as calories are entering the bloodstream that rapidly. It stopped, and, and eating oil stops fat loss for not just for days even. And what I'm saying right now is, like and Alan said earlier, salt and oil are appetite stimulants. They both signify do um, stimulate dopamine stimulation in the brain. But when you're absorbing nuts and seeds at one or two calories a minute, right, it's not gonna be, it's completely different because you're not gonna be storing it as fat. The body primarily looks to burn it for energy preferentially rather than store it as fat. But when you have 200 to 300 calories of oil into the bloodstream, there's no way the body can preferentially burn it as energy. It chooses to get the fat out of the bloodstream as rapidly as possible and it starts revving up fat storage hormones. And because, and so what I'm saying right now is that oil and, fat and, and salt prevents people from successfully getting their body fat low enough. And if they don't get their body fat low enough, they're not gonna get the anti-cancer effects that we want for them hormonally. We want people not to, you know, to, we want people to be, not to have a big, you know, to have, um, a, what is it called? A six pack. We want people to have a six pack and not, and not rolls of fat hanging over their waist. And people eat healthy and they don't lose weight. And look at all the people eating you know, vegan or plant-based who are still overweight, the vast majority of them. And the salt and oil is, is interfering with their ability to get that extra weight off. And what I'm saying right now is that olive oil is a, is a factor leading to a higher risk of breast cancer because olive oil is keeping people from keep getting their extra fat off their body. And the extra fat on the body is keeping their insulin resistance high, their aromatase enzyme activated, and their angiogenesis promotion going too, too excessively. So it is important. So, so, getting, so what I'm saying is a completely different biological effect from eating a pecan or a pistachio nut and pecans or pecan oil or, pecan oil or pistachio oil. You can't control the calories when you're doing the oils compared to the moderate use of nuts. Okay. Right. <laughs> well, you know, you, you made, uh, you um, quoted an interesting statistic that about two and a half percent of the people are eating a healthy diet, an actual healthy diet. And I think that's my point. We have got to change that number. So whatever we have to do to change that number, let's try to work together to make that happen. So the two things I was asked to talk about is gastrointestinal difficulties and how to resolve them. And the resolution is different for different ones. I mean, for celiac patients, they have to restrict all gluten, and then you have to repair the gastrointestinal tract and adopt a healthy diet. And for inflammatory bowel disease, we have a five-step program that involves a very uh, bland diet of cooked foods, and we phase in more normal plant-based eating over time. Um, so it's difficult to, I guess the thing that I could say about all of these conditions is that they're brought about principally 
by eating a terrible diet, a little bit of genetic predisposition in the case of um, inflammatory bowel disease, for example, but, and celiac, but principally uh, brought about by eating the standard American diet and conversion to a low-fat plant-based diet is the best hope of making them better. One uh, gastrointestinal condition that's a bit of an exception to the rule is irritable, ir irritable bowel. And the reason I say that is that for people who truly have irritable bowel, and it's very overdiagnosed, but for people who really have it, there's a psychological component that must be dealt with. And if you don't deal with it, the person won't get better. Now, I mentioned that it's overdiagnosed, and, and this is an important factor, because if you just have constipation or diarrhea, and you change your diet and it gets better, you never had irritable bowel. But if you have constipation or diarrhea or they alternate, and you change your diet, and so I guess coming back a little bit, I've got ahead of myself. So what I'm saying is that when people go to doctors and they say I have gastrointestinal difficulties, my, my bowel's all screwed up, I'm constipated one day and the next day I'm, anything that they can't find another thing to call it, it gets called irritable bowel. So you get these statistics, there are like 45 million people in the United States who have irritable bowel, they don't, all right? You have 45 million people who are constipated or have diarrhea or it alternates, and about 10 million of them have irritable bowel. The rest of them will get better when they change their diet. And those who actually have irritable bowel will require some type of psychological intervention in order to get better. I teach a seven lecture course on it, and it's much more complicated than what I'm telling you, but I think it's the exception to the rule in terms of resolving gastrointestinal disorders. The other question had to do with smoothies. I have smoothies. We teach people how to make smoothies. I don't see any reason for people not to have smoothies. Um, there are some who say that the, when the food is all ground up, then you don't get the benefit of the nutrients, and that's really not true, or that you won't get the uh, cardiovascular benefits of the food. That's really not true. If you want to pay attention to the one thing that would make a huge difference in achieving the cardiovascular benefits of green food that's made into a smoothie, it has more to do with the bacteria in your mouth than anything else. So one thing that people can do to improve how they process food is to stay away from mouthwash, except in situations where it's really, really necessary because it wipes out all the bacteria in your mouth. So for people who are concerned about things like nitric oxide production of eating green food, like if I don't chew it, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to get the benefit of nitric oxide. Oxide really doesn't have anything to do with chewing. It has to do with um, the condition of the microbiome in the mouth. So it won't matter if you chew it or not. What matters is that bacteria. So I think that's my two. Okay, so as specifically as possible, what exactly should we eat? Name it as direct, you know, as specific as you can, and you know, in three minutes or two minutes, what exactly for the next year, for people who want to be healthy, have energy, lose weight, feel great, what specifically, more specifically than just whole food plant-based diet, what specifically are you recommending that people eat? to be full, satisfied, and healthy? So it would be a whole plant food SOS free diet made up of fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and that's it. I have a really simple way for people to know if they look at any product, should they have it or not. If they get very quiet and go inside themselves and they ask themselves, do I really, really, really want whatever it is? And the answer is truly yes, you know. You can't have it. <laughs> you get nothing. Uh, okay, interaction time again. What is probably the nastiest, vilest substance you can think of that you would not want to put your hand in? Uh, can I hear some words, huh? Vomit. Vomit, okay, yeah, that's pretty gross. But something a little worse than that. Poop, right? A, a fresh cow patty. And then maybe some, like, really nasty dirt, right? So what if I scooped up a, uh, like half of a fresh cow patty and then went out and got some dirt and mixed it all up and took a pinto bean and stuck it down in there? What would happen? I would get this pristine plant that was perfect. That's how powerful beans are. So whatever you eat, make sure legumes are a regular part of your diet because they are incredibly powerful and healthful organisms to eat and they impart that uh, to your body when you eat them. 
So include legumes in your diet at least three to four times a week, whole grains, fresh green leafy vegetables, and color. You know what? It's like God likes color. He doesn't want you living in a neighborhood with all one color people. He doesn't want you eating a plate that has only one color. I tell people the only white things at your dinner table should be the tablecloth and the people eating the food. Everything else needs to have some color. Okay, our four major food groups are fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And then we use a pyramid formation, so you can see that the stuff at the top, you eat a lot less of than the stuff at the bottom. But those are the foundational foods, using starchy foods as, um, as the calorie density part of the plate. And then lots of fruits and vegetables. And you made the comment about people being hungry when they try to live on salads and fruit. So you really, to, to make this work, you need to eat squashes and potatoes and, and um, beets and, and your legumes and whole grains to make this work. So that's what my meals look like every day. Pam, you did, your four groups left out nuts and seeds. Do you let people eat nuts and seeds? Um, yeah, we, the, that's further up in the pyramid. And one of the ways that we have people eat nuts and seeds is when they're part of dishes. Like not a, not a like everyday have some, but, but yeah, they can, they can use them when they're part of dishes that they're making or they come on foods that they order in restaurants and that sort of thing. So we don't restrict them entirely. Well, just to make it clear, the Seventh-day Adventist studies, as well as um, corroborative evidence from every other study looking at the issue, show that as you divided nuts and seeds into five different quintiles, the lowest quintile of nut and seed consumption had an approximately 40% increased risk of cardiovascular death and about a 29% increase in all-cause mortality compared to the highest quintile of nut and seed consumption, which was consuming about an ounce and a half a day. So when they compared people eating about a third, a half of an ounce or less, or a third of an ounce or less on the average, compared to people eating over an ounce a day, there was pretty remarkable differences in longevity for people excluding fat from their diets so aggressively. And of course, the type of fat we're talking about is that nuts and seeds don't just prevent against cardiovascular arrhythmia, but they also protect against cancer, powerfully have anti-cancer effects as well. Just thought I'd throw that in. So the dietary style I design includes advising people to have a salad at least once a day. And then instead of using an oil-based dressing on a salad, to use a dressing made from nuts, some nuts and seeds in place of oil. Of course, we're not snacking on nuts and seeds. We don't want to have an unlimited amount of them because we want people to be aware of their overall caloric need and not exceeding their caloric needs. We want them to have at least one serving a day of beans, one serving a day of salad, one, and maybe a, a vegetable bean soup. That's where as my, I, I want to make the lunch the most important meal of the day, and I want people to memorize the lunch. They could modify their dinner and breakfast and make and change it around. For breakfast, they can have juice or fruit or, or something, or they can have a smoothie, or they can have some steel cut oats or quinoa, or they can have a, a squash soup, or whatever it is they're having. And dinner could mod be modified to something else, and uh, you know, it could be a tomato sauce, or it could be a, um, a vegetable wok, or it could be a lot of different things. But the lunch, I want the lunch to be pretty consistent so I know people are getting these basic powerfully anti-cancer foods in. So we want them to have a big salad every day for the lunch, for what they chew really well, with some raw cruciferous on top, with a dressing made from nuts and seeds, not oil, because that facilitates the absorption of the anti-cancer compounds, even as much as 20 to 50 fold increased absorption of carotenoids and other fat soluble nutrients in the food when you compare to eating a salad with no fat, that meal with no fat in it. And, and then they have a bowl of vegetable bean soup, a hearty serving of some kind, because of, beans are um, very, very longevity protective in the most, and on, a, on a scale of carbohydrate hierarchy, of which has the most anti-cancer longevity promoting effects, beans seem to have the most documented effects at lowering rates of cancer and extending human life, and have, they fire, have the most resistant starch, have the most fiber, have the most phytochemicals, have the most nutrient density. So we want people to get a good portion of the, at least once a day of that bean serving of a chili or a bean dish or a soup or a stew or something with their salad and a piece of fruit for dessert. So more flexible with breakfast and dinner, I want people to, as Alan said, to have that extended period of fasting at night where they eat an earlier and a lighter dinner, so they have that at least the 14 hours in, and, and really stress the fact we don't want people to go to sleep on a full stomach, we want them to go to sleep on an empty stomach, so we want them to eat dinner early enough so they don't so they digest before they go to bed at night, or eat a light enough dinner if they can't eat early, then make dinner lighter so you still don't go to sleep with a lot of food and heavy to digest food in your stomach. 
you eat your lunch as your main meal of the day. Um, do you make a distinction between grains such as quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, wild rice that are non-glutinous grains compared with grains such as um, wheat, oats, and barley? Do you make a distinction when we use the word whole grains between quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, and wild rice which are non-glutinous versus grains that do have gluten like wheat, oats, and barley? So we, we, we use um, non-glutinous grains. We don't use wheat, rye, or barley routinely with anybody just because we find a high percentage of people, even if they don't have celiac disease or frank allergies, do better. And most of those high gluten grains are typically served as flour products or highly processed food products, which we also uh, avoid. So we, we, the, the, we use a wide variety of grains, all of the ones you've mentioned, including things like wild rice, other types of formats, uh, but we found it better to avoid the high gluten grains uh, in any form. Um, my concern is that um, most of the wild rice grown in this country is commercially grown wild rice. It's not wildly grown wild rice. And therefore, there's still too much arsenic contamination in commercially grown wild rice, where the other grains are more favorable because they don't suck up arsenic as much as the rice does, even wild rice. Now, you can buy wildly grown wild rice that's harvested by wild, um, by like Native Americans who knock it down in the marshes in their canoes where they're not commercially grown and, they, and these are much safer sources of, of whole grains. So yes, the, um, so the concern, and I noticed you didn't mention, was regular brown rice and that's our concern today because the brown rice patties grown on cotton fields and, and um, areas where they're using chicken manure that have been contaminated and because rice takes up, brown rice takes up too much arsenic compared to other grains, we're kind of more recently avoiding more rice and using those other grains like colorful quinoa and some of the other grains mentioned as the source of whole grain and intact grain. And as Alan said, trying more and more not to grind them into flour, but to eat them in their intact form, cooked with water, to minimize their glycemic effect. I'm clearly trying to kill myself, and I have a death wish for all the people we're helping too, because we even allow, I hope you, you are all sitting down, yes? Some of our people eat bread, okay? I mean, and so again, we're not, using, we're not restricting gluten-containing foods unless people have celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease. Certain autoimmune patients shouldn't have it. Um, but we're trying to, again, we're trying to get people to do this in a community setting for a long period of time. And so we're not restricting those grains and we even allow some processed food. Again, the key is showing people a diagram so they can see clearly if they're eating according to plan. And you know, people eat bread all over the world. Some of the longest lived people on the planet eat bread. Not everybody should eat bread and not everybody should eat processed foods. Again, looking at differences in populations that we're serving. But because we're serving a more general population that isn't as sick and as motivated and we're trying to get them to do it for a long period of time, we're not restricting grains unnecessarily and we're not even restricting processed grains in that you can't have them. But when the processed food is higher intake than the whole foods at the bottom of our pyramid, then people know that they have to make a change. Uh, just to, as a reference, I have absolutely nothing to do with this company, but there is a company called White Earth Wild Rice, and their email, their website is realwildrice.com, and they take canoes, and they go into somewhere in Minnesota into the lakes, and they farm out their own wild rice, and it definitely looks different than others, so just pointing that out. Um, uh, in terms of uh, potatoes, um, white potatoes, are potatoes part of everyone's plan? I know sweet potatoes we've heard good things about. When I, a potato is part of everyone's plan. Okay, can I, I just have to take this question because um, years, for years there was this video circulating on the internet and people would refer to it as the food fight. Me and Don McDougall, you were there, got into, it was one of Jeff um, Nelson's uh, events down in Southern California. We got into this whole big thing about potatoes because you know, John McDougall's all about starch, which I agree, starch, 
it should uh, is, is a basis for our diet. Basically, my point was, I think that when we eat potatoes, we should try to stick to the smaller um, uh, yellow, red, uh, even purple varieties because they have a higher starch to fiber content, which is why their flesh is waxier than these big, giant, obese russets that we've bred. Um, and um, I just think that they're healthier. Um, whereas John just said, potatoes, potatoes. Um, so that's my bias. We gotta be careful because when people think about potatoes, what do they really think about? French fries. French fries, potato chips, and potatoes they turn into butter boats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, potatoes have a higher glycemic index than other starches, so if you're trying to re do short-term blood sugar regulation, sometimes people find they do better with other types, you know, squashes and sweet potatoes and other things. Uh, in my experience, if, if you're taking potatoes with large amounts of raw and cooked vegetable material, even for those people that are sensitive, they can generally tolerate uh, the inclusion of potatoes. We don't, we don't particularly restrict them. I think you probably have a different... Yeah. I, um... I guess the, like, we make a great cauliflower mashed potato where we take, like, a mostly cauliflower and just put a little potato into it, so it's mostly a little more glycemic. I think most of the data on plant foods is that all plant foods don't have an equal amount of protection against cancer, and you can only put so much calories on your plate each day. And we want to encourage eating more voluminous and more liberally of foods that have more powerful, protective, anti-cancerous effects. That's why we emphasize more colorful plants and more beans in the diet other than potatoes. And we also know that as, a, as so many of our patients and clients are significantly overweight with diabetes, that we try to re, um, adjust the amount of carbohydrates based on that hierarchical scale of nutritional quality, fiber, resistant starch content, and glycemic effect of those carbohydrates. So when we're dealing with people that are fragile and have medical conditions, we get better results when we give them less potato and more beans. And, we, and, and so we, we can only, they can only take in so many calories a day and some of these people's diet has to be carefully designed to maximize their weight loss and because some of their metabolic, they have metabolic hindrances to weight loss. They don't lose weight as easy as other people do. And we find that when people are more overweight, their response to a potato or a higher glycemic carbohydrate is more, is um, higher, they have a much more glycemic response. Whereas if they're healthier and thinner eating a healthy diet, they can tolerate more potato. And I agree, of course, with what was said earlier, that the potatoes of yesteryear and those heirloom potatoes that are smaller and more colorful have more fiber, have more nutrients than the big Idaho or those are big potatoes that are designed and are genetically modified yeah. to be to designed to be have the, to be made into French fries into what people want to eat. And if you looked at the potatoes from Peru and other places that primitive populations eat, they weren't like the potatoes of today. They were potatoes of yesteryear were smaller, more colorful, and had more fiber chemical index. So I'm not. I use potatoes in, but more a little more judiciously especially with people that are significantly overweight sure. or diabetic. Yeah, we've even bred our food to be obese. Um, <laughs> what are you saying? And the, small, uh, the, small, the smaller varieties of the potatoes with the waxier flesh actually have a much better glycemic index, and you would make french fries out of those. You would hopefully roast them and, in, or include them in a stew or something like that uh, with other vegetables, and, and they would uh, uh, do much better physiologically. And I think you bring up a good point. We don't eat just potatoes, and we don't eat just broccoli, and we don't eat just this or that. So the glycemic index of an individual food gets somewhat non, um, irrelevant when you start making meals. And so, um, and the other thing too is that the, the glycemic index is complicated. I wish it was more usable, but if you go look at the charts, you should eat ice cream instead of carrots and Mars bars instead of white bread and, or whole wheat bread. I mean, it, so, so it's so complicated that I don't even like to talk to people about it because if they really check it out, they'll be more confused than they were before I brought it up. So unless you have somebody who's like a mono eater, like they just eat one food per meal, you can have a lot of latitude in the type of potatoes that they're eating because the potato, you know what the best potato is for a new person coming into my office? The one that they're gonna be willing to eat tonight, okay? 
and, and I keep coming back to this. Um, my personal preference is sweet potatoes and purple potatoes, and, and I've gained a, I've, I mean, I've gained a taste for them over the years, like we've been talking about it. So what I'm willing to do at this particular point in my life is different than what some newer people were willing to do. So if a russet potato is what you will eat, and you will do that instead of cheese pizza from Domino's, I love russet potatoes. That's our starting point. <laughs> We can move from there. And the glycemic index gets negated because I don't have anybody sitting down eating russet potatoes for dinner. They're having a big salad and a russet potato and some vegetables, and that usually makes it okay. So. Pam, you're so good. I tell them if they touch a russet, I'm ascending the black van to pick them up. <laughs> if you would each make a one-minute closing statement on any final thoughts you have for the evening. I guess my one minute closing statement is that as human beings, we are uh, plant eaters and that the greatest health is found in eating a diet that is comprised of the greatest diversity of plant foods. And, you know, because people always ask me, well, you know, what's the one thing I should eat? What is the one? No. Every different whole plant food just like every different person in this room has something wonderful and valuable to offer. And so as many different plant foods as you can include in your diet, the healthier you will be and the more re re disease resistance. So remember, variety and diversity is truly the spice of life. Eat a diverse, whole food, plant-based diet. Um, agreed. Um, I think my closing statement would be that everybody here agrees that a whole foods plant-based diet is the best. And I think we should focus on the things that we have in common, not the things that we have differences of opinion about. And if you really look closely, the things that we have differences of opinion about are based on the audience, different audiences that we serve. And I'll keep coming back to this issue that we've got to invite more people into the tent because we've got to get to the place where someday we're going to congregate here and instead of 2.5% of the people eating a health-promoting diet, it's going to be 27% of the people. And then it's easier to get to 35 and 50 and 75 and all the way home. So focus on the important big ideas we're sharing. Don't get so lost in the weeds. Um, I, I, my last statement will be a statement of hope and, of the, and optimism. And that, to, that my always message is always that I want people to know that they don't have to suffer with medical conditions for the rest of their life, that they're told by the regular doctors that they have to be sick forever or have happened to them what happens to other Americans. You don't have to suffer with autoimmune conditions, that your body is a miraculous self-healing machine when fed ideally and optimally. And we have the ability today to use nutritional science uh, um, in a selected and, and targeted fashion to help people get well from most chronic, serious medical conditions. And we can live a life free of fear of cancer, heart attacks, strokes, or dementia. And that opportunity is now available to all, for all. So health results from healthful living. Healthful living involves diet, sleep, and exercise. So the diet that we advocate is a whole plant food, SOS-free diet. Exercise should be abundant and enjoyable, and sleep should be bountiful so that you can wake spontaneously feeling refreshed. Thank <laughs> you.